morning, church. Happy Epiphany. We praise Him this morning. Sing holy with me. Weekly Word is an online way for us at Gracious Savior Church to reach out to people who can't come to our in-person Sunday services at 9.30 a.m. But if you live in the Vale Valley, we would love to see you there. You can see our mission and ministries up on the screen right now. And if you have a question about any of these as they show up, go ahead and let us know. Reach out to us by clicking on one of our email links in the description of this video. But this leads into our new sermon series starting January 7th, which essentially boils down to this. If you could ask God anything, what would it be? Also starting January 7th is Mountaintop Worship. You can get a little bit of extra fun, Jesus and skiing in at Spruce Saddle at 12.30 p.m. for a small devotional sized worship service with Matt. If you'd like to volunteer to help or just attend, you can email Matt by using his link in the description below. Now it's time for a message from God's Word with Pastor Jason. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are starting up a new series called The Big Questions. And what they are is we asked people during our Christmas Eve service to turn in responses to, to certain questions. We ask questions like, 
What questions have you always wanted to ask God about? What are some hurts that still challenge your relationship with God? What are some questions about God, the Bible, spiritual issues that you wrestle with? And we received over 90 responses. And so we're working on categorizing them in a responsible way. It's going to be about, I think, about an eight-week series at this point. We got a lot of questions about heaven. Questions like, what happens in heaven? Will dogs be in heaven? What is heaven like? Will I see my favorite dogs, pets, animals? Will I see my family, my wife? What do you do forever? What are your hobbies, God? Will I see my parents and family in heaven? Will there be animals in heaven? Will we be fellowshipping with loved ones from the past? And how will we spend our time? So just to sample some of the questions we got about heaven. So we're going to talk about that today in part of our series called The Big Questions. So first, what is heaven not? Heaven is not eternity in the clouds. We do not become angels. Angels are very distinct beings from humans. We do not change our nature in heaven. We do not unite with the force or become one with God or become part of the one or whatever that is. We do not become wholly spiritual. We are not bodiless beings in heaven. That's what heaven isn't. So what is heaven? I looked around. I tried to find a definition of heaven, a short description of heaven. And this is the best I could come up with. You might come up with a better description, but this is what I came up with. Heaven is where God is perfectly present in perfect community with his perfect people and his perfect creation. That's what heaven is. Where God is perfectly present in perfect community with his perfect people in his perfect creation. So where is that described in the Bible? Where do we see heaven described? Well, not ironically, two big places. Genesis 1 and Revelation 21. So in Genesis 1, it doesn't describe heaven, but it does describe God perfectly present with his perfect creation and perfect community with his people. That's Genesis chapter 1. God creates and he describes his creation as very good. Creation is perfect. It does not battle against mankind. And people, they tend for it. They, they care for it. It produces food. It's work, but it's not laborious. It's stewarding God's creation. And God is present, and animals are present, and it's paradise. It's paradise. It's heaven on earth. More appropriately, it's heaven. And most importantly, people are not hiding from God. God and humanity are are in perfect community with one another. And then mankind breaks away from God and everything falls apart. Creation battles against humanity and, and battles, it's, it's, it's a battle to provide food, clothing, shelter. That all becomes hard work, becomes laborious. And our relationships with one another are broken. The first murder takes place soon after the fall and God is not perfectly present with his people. Our relationship with God is broken. And this is all described as being restored in Revelation 21, near the end of the Bible. The Apostle John gives a, is given a vision of heaven, and this is what he wrote, Revelation 21. He wrote this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully, <coughs> excuse me, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, 
for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the adulterers, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the wall, the city, with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. He measured its walls and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the sill third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardin, sardinix, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrys chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty the Lamb or its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb as its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This description is very different from Genesis 1. Instead of a beautiful garden, we see an incredible city. And when you think city, you know, for us here in the mountains, we think Denver or, or New York. But this, this is a gorgeous city. It's a city like no other. It's described as being approximately 1,200 miles wide, long, and tall. It's a, it's a cube. It's a city like you've never seen before. But better than that, there are no death or sickness or tears of any kind in this city. In this city, God has removed all of your hurts and your fears and your brokenness and your sin. So let's go a little bit deeper into this definition of heaven. Heaven is where God is perfectly present. That God is victorious. Think about every heartache in your life. Every cancer that took a loved one. Every betrayal that tore your heart. Every disease that attacked your mom or dad or grandparent as they slowly and painfully passed away. Think about it, all of it, all of that crap. And now it's gone. 
God has healed your brokenness, cured your heartache, replaced your bitterness with joy. God has destroyed dementia, canceled cancer, eliminated earthquakes. God has waged war on war and won. How hard would it be for you to cheer for that type of victory? How long would you praise the one who gave you that type of joy? Now, I remember, I remember when I moved here to the Valley and the Broncos won the Super Bowl and y'all went nuts for it. And it was fun and it was awesome. I remember when my Rams won the Super Bowl. I sat there at the end of the game and I couldn't believe it. They had actually won the game. Those were good times. And it was just a game. When the Bible describes heaven, it usually describes the people of God worshiping and praising God. And the reason they're worshiping and praising God because it's because of God's victory over sin, his victory over death, his victory over evil, his victory over Satan, all of that. And that is no small thing. God is perfectly present because he's perfectly victorious over sin and death and evil. And this is a God who has done it all for you. This God, this God loves you. He does not love you at your best. This God knows you fully and completely and you are fully and completely loved. That's our greatest wish. The greatest wish in our lives is to be fully known and fully loved. It's also our greatest fear to be fully known. Marriage is the laboratory. It's a laboratory to be fully known and fully loved. And quite honestly, we haven't done all that well in that laboratory. And one of the reasons there's no marriage in heaven is because the lamb, Jesus, the groom of his church, fulfills this role of knowing you completely and loving you fully that God is perfectly present. And he's perfectly present in perfect community with his perfect people. There are actually quite a few descriptions and depictions of heaven in the Bible. And one of my favorites is from Isaiah chapter 25. It says this, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And that day they will say, surely this is our God, we trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Isaiah 25 describes heaven as a party, and not just any party, the best party, for the best reason. I mean, you might throw a party to celebrate a marriage, or for Thanksgiving, or Christmas, and those, those are good parties. But this party, this is a party to celebrate the end of death, and sin. Death is swallowed up forever. Disgrace is removed completely from you and for me. This is a party of all parties with the best of meats and the finest of wines. And so imagine, imagine heaven. But imagine hanging out with a bunch of people and they're all your friends. Everyone from every race and nation, and you're having a blast together. There's no pride. There's no self-righteousness. There's no conceit. There's no one-upping each someone another with a better story. You know, oh, let me tell you this story, right? Unless that's a story about what Jesus has done for you. Heaven is a sinless community. It's family as family was originally designed to be. So will you see your loved ones 
who passed away in Christ. Yes. Yes, you will. You'll be ecstatic to see all of them. You'll remember your life on earth together. And you'll rejoice at the good times and worship Jesus for redeeming the bad times. You will meet your great, great grandma and marvel at all the things you have in common that will all take place. And you're going to meet a guy. His name will be Sanjay. I don't know Sanjay and you don't know Sanjay, but I promise you there will be a guy named Sanjay who lived in the early 20th century in India and heard about Jesus and was fascinated by him and by the idea of grace and forgiveness and yearned for Jesus. You will meet Sanjay and you're going to love that guy because heaven is where God is perfectly present with his perfect people and perfect community. And so you'll see all your family members and it's going to be great. But in heaven, we'll all be family. And that's the second reason why there's no marriage in heaven. Because we're all together, all family, all united under Jesus Christ, who fully knows and fully loves each and every one of us. Heaven is where God is perfectly present in perfect community with his perfect people in his perfect creation. So now the part that many of you have asked me about. What about the dogs? What about the dogs? And the answer is, I have no idea. The Bible is really centered on God's work to redeem humanity. It's really the focus of the Bible. But not solely centered on that. There's an interesting text in Romans chapter 8. And Paul writes this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, creation itself waits for the fulfillment of Jesus' work on the cross and in the empty tomb his resurrection. That creation waits for this, Paul says. And creation includes rivers and trees and mountains and dogs. And, and cats. And cats too, for sure. All right, so will your awesome dog that you had as a kid be in heaven? I don't know. I don't know. Scripture's not very specific about that. And so, because Scripture's not specific, I'm not going to say confidently one way or another. But, if I had to guess, and I'm just guessing, I would say that dogs will definitely be in heaven. And cats and, and guinea pigs and you know, gerbils and, and all of creation. That they'll be there. Will your dog be there? I, I don't know. I got some dogs that I'd love to see there personally. And I'm, I'm hopeful that I will because all creation includes dogs for sure. So I'm going to guess and say yes, but I really am just guessing. But what will you be doing in God's perfect creation? Everything you were created to do. When God created the universe way back in Genesis 1, he gave work to Adam and Eve. They were to steward creation. And so you will not be some body-less being floating around with nothing to do. You'll be doing what you're created to do. And you are created for two things. One, first, is to worship. Our hearts were designed to worship. And we will worship God perfectly. You are also created 
to work. Not work as you know it. Not toiling for a paycheck and just trying to survive. Not worked and stressed out of your mind, but created to use the gifts that God has given you, the gifts and talents that God gave you to serve those around you. You are created by our creator. And this means you are a sub creator. You make things, you build things, you write things, you, you paint things, you cook things. Winston Churchill, he, he put it this way. When I get to heaven, I mean to spend a considerable portion of my first million years in painting and so get to the bottom of the subject. You'll do what you love to do. You'll do what you're created to do and to play and to work and to be and to love. So I hope I, I answered most of the questions as best I could. If you have some other questions I, I didn't you know, touch on, I would love to meet with you sometime in, in person. You can, you can call me up, you can email me, whatever you'd like to do. And I'd love to have just a, a chat about your questions about heaven. But I want to conclude with this great quote from the, uh, the great band Toad the Wet Sprocket when they say, it's not the place where you live, it's the place where you belong. And let's stop with all this patronizing nonsense about heaven being a better place. It's poor theology and it's poor grammar. Because we know there's good and there's better and there's best. in Christ, we do not go to a better place. We go to the best place. Amen. Come Lord Jesus.